Am I in? Hey, Ken, you're in. And I see Christian is watching. I'm going to invite him to join us. Can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see Kenny's hand. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Ken, I think your camera is sideways. I know because I can't put it on the bracket upright. Uh, it doesn't fit. Let me see. How do I? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait. No. No. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in a minute. Thank you to everyone who's joining us now. We are going to get started at noon on the dot. So stick around. We're super excited to have you all here. And uh, we're going to be kicking off this alumni charla in just a second. So going to give people a minute to join us and then we'll get started. I see some people already joining us. Awesome. So hi, everyone. My name is Monica Alvarez Cunningham, and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement for the University of Florida's Association of Hispanic Alumni. And today we're kicking off Hispanic Heritage Month, which means that just around the corner, we have our annual Hispanic Alumni Weekend. Uh, Hispanic Alumni Weekend this year is presented by the College of Journalism and Communications, which is super exciting to me. It's the college I graduated from back in 2007. And uh, as a shout out to the CJC, as we affectionately call it, I have two of my fellow classmates uh, from back in the day. I have Christian de la Rosa Sandoval and Ken Molestina joining us. So uh, Christian, I love the shirt. I love that you're representing WUFT. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, when you graduated, and what you've been up to since graduating? I legit haven't worn this polo shirt since school. So it's well, been many, many, many years. I love um, it. <laughs> we're sounding a little scratchy. I just got back from uh, Alaska with a little bit of a cold. So anyway, <clears throat> Uh, I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, that is where I grew up. Um, I graduated and I think we graduated in, was it fall 2006? But I lie about it until people are graduated in 2007, just because it sounds. <laughs> um, and since then, I've been uh, hard at work, crisscrossing the country. I went from UF to Panama City Beach. From there, I went to Orlando. From there, I went to San Diego and did some work in LA and Tijuana, Mexico. Um, from there to Atlanta, and then here to Miami, where I've been for the past five years. I've um, uh, been a reporter, been an anchor reporter in English and Spanish, um, and I currently I am a general assignment reporter here in Miami at WPLG, which is the ABC News affiliate. Awesome. Thank you for that. And Ken, what about you? Where are you from? When did you graduate? And what have you been up to? I like I like Christian's. Uh, we graduated in 2007, right? Because it was so late in 2006 that why not? Right. It wasn't really 2006, was it? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Christian graduated in the same class. We were in the same graduating ceremony. Uh, it was it was December of 2006. But we're going to go with seven. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so hi guys, uh, yeah, my name's Ken uh, Molestina. I'm uh, was born in New York, raised in Miami. Uh, I claim Miami as my hometown, um, and uh, I got my start in El Paso. That was my first job. Uh, as most of us who work in this industry, we know that you know you got to start off somewhere small, and sometimes that means going really far from home. Uh, and I think from our graduating class, I was probably one of the ones that had to drive the furthest for his first job. <laughs> Christian just went up to the, the panhandle of the state <laughs> at Panama City Beach. But I literally went uh, to to the the, uh, the most the far most west point in Texas. Uh, that was El Paso on the border with uh, with Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. I was there for about um, close to four years. And then from there, I went to go work in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the uh, CBS affiliate there. And. I was there for three years, uh, and now I'm in uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth, working for the the CBS O and O station. Uh, I'm an anchor and reporter. I anchor the four o'clock and a bunch of other little things here uh, as well. And I've uh, been here for about uh, eight and a half years now. So uh, this has been my longest stay, I think, anywhere since I since I left Miami uh, when I was I think it was eighteen or nineteen when I left home. 
Yeah, those of us who work in or have worked in television know that you bounce around a lot. I was born in New Jersey, grew up in Miami, so I also claim Miami. Um, and I know that I've had the chance to run into you guys, you know, throughout our careers as we've been in different areas, um, which is always nice. So let me ask you, and I'll start with you, Ken. Uh, when or why did you want to go into <clears throat> journalism and why did you choose UF? So, you know, I, I, I always enjoyed the idea of informing people. Uh, I was the guy in high school that, you know, got into pep rallies and football games with a camera on my shoulder. And I loved recording things and just documenting things. It was just kind of a hobby. It was just something that I did for fun uh, during those times. Um, and then as, you know, college came around and it came time to get a little serious about what you wanted to do uh, as a grown up for a career, uh, it seemed like a natural path for me. Uh, initially, I wanted to do uh, sports. Uh, like many other guys, you know, that, that, that have the experience of covering high school sports and that sort of thing. You think that's the path you want to go in. Uh, and I initially started down that road, uh, but then quickly realized that my passion really lied in, in, in news and in, in information sharing. Um, and I was just always attracted to the ability to do that for people uh, and the ability to be in certain places where maybe others can't. And you're kind of like the middleman trying to inform people uh, and trying to give them, a, you know, the, the, the information that they need uh, and the news that they need. So I always enjoyed that. And uh, I still do. And I think that's why Christian now, what, 16 years into this now, why we're still here, right? Because I think that's that's still the reason that gets us up. <laughs> yeah, we ran out of fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, and, you know, I could kind of see back when we were in college that you still had that little love for sports. I was on the sports track oh, yeah. and you – you know, would kind of dip your toe and, and join us for games every now and then. So uh, why did you choose UF? Oh, wow. Well, uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, I, I, I did think that I wanted to leave Miami. I wanted to go. I wanted to experience, you know, going away from home, but maybe not terribly far because I also got accepted into Syracuse and the University of Missouri. Uh, and and I, I didn't go that far. So I think that was just kind of a nice place uh, distance wise to go. Uh, I grew up watching Emmett Smith play, uh, you know, college football and he was a Gator and there, there was that kind of thing going on. Uh, but once I realized that I really wanted to pursue a journalism career, um, UF made the most sense because they have a fantastic program. Uh, it, it was just a just an unbelievable program. Then uh, it's even better now. Um, and, and I think also just the value, the fact that it was an in-state school, it was a public university. Uh, I knew that, you know, uh, cost wise, it was something that was going to be a little bit easier to handle. I'm the first of my family to go to college. Um, so, you know, that this was kind of a first, uh, experience for, for my parents, for myself. Um, and obviously I didn't want it to be too much of a hefty bill, uh, that we would have to pay. That's awesome. And I think your story probably resonates. Yeah, it was just a good deal. <laughs> it was just a good deal. <laughs> I think your story res is going to resonate with a lot of people, uh, you know, watching and a lot of current students that are coming from backgrounds similar to ours. So, Christian, how about you? Uh, why did you want to go into broadcasting and why U.S.? My story is very different. Um, <clears throat> I was actually a transfer student. I, tra I transferred from the University of Puerto Rico, where I was going to school for pre-law and um, labor relations law. And... Um, to make a very long story short, I ended up at UF because I wanted to leave Puerto Rico and I had to pick a school. And it was kind of like this. Okay, uh, <laughs> University of Florida sounds right. And I end up there. There is no labor law program. And so I thought to myself, what well, sounds like fun? <laughs> um, and I literally walked into Weimar and, you know, applied to transfer to that school. I mean, I, I will say I, I've always been um, attracted to anything that has to do with, um, I guess, advocacy for people in need. Um, and I was always very attracted to the ability that journalism gives you to connect people and communities to information or expose an injustice. It's the whole reason why I went into labor law. And so it just seemed like a good fit. Uh, but like Kenny said, I lucked out that this was one of the best broadcast programs in the country and still is. And still to this day, I always say, you know, even being out of school for what, almost 20 years or whatever it is, <laughs> uh, 
Has it been really 20 years? I don't think it's been. From high school. But, yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. You can tell who went to a good school and who didn't. Um, and I'm just, you know, extremely grateful. That's how I ended up at UF in the broadcast program. So obviously a very noble reason for choosing this career. Uh, Ken and I won't hold it against you that you weren't drinking the Gatorade back in high school and when you decided to go to UF. But obviously now you do have fond memories of your alma mater. Uh, what is one of your favorite memories from UF? <clears throat> I was thinking about this and I can't come up with one. So I'll give you several. Um, I think of graduation day. I've seen Kenny there and just feeling like, wow, this, this is happening, we made it. Um, I think of um, just the friends that I uh, made. Uh, I think of my first live shot at WUFT and come to the realization that this actually happened and that it uh, wasn't a total disaster. Um, <clears throat> and then I also go back to this moment and maybe this is a little mushy and emotional, but I remember walking across the field outside of the stadium I was walking, it was around 4.30 in the morning. I'm walking towards an, a shift at AM850. Mm. And, I, and I start like crying, like tears start coming down my face. Just, I don't know if it was the stress of it all, but just the realization that I'm a kid from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm walking to AM850 to read of all things, the sports brief, you know, in a morning shift at an English radio station. What am I doing? I, it kind of, it was that moment where I went from kind of like the imposter syndrome to the realization that I'm really doing this. I'm here and, you know, let's, let's go for it. And I always think back to that moment of like actually reaching a point where I believed that I could, that I could do this. Cause you know, as as I'm as a minority student, and I think maybe you guys can um, identify with this. You know, you you have a little bit of an imposter syndrome. I think, at least for me, I felt like I had to work so much harder than everybody else in order to prove that I deserved to be there. When in fact, I think it was most of it just internally. I had to prove to myself that I could be there by working that much harder by taking that morning shift that nobody else wanted and you know proving to myself and to anybody else who needed to be who needed who needed to to see me actually doing it prove that I could do it so that was a really long answer but that's my answer no i love it christian and you know i definitely can relate like for me going to uf it wasn't super far coming from miami and you know, I was born in the U.S., but I grew up, you know, in this Hispanic community. And you know that UF is one of the top programs for so many things, but especially for broadcasting. So, yes, you know, you go to the school, you know, you're with all these other talented students. And I think we all kind of do have to go through that imposter syndrome. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I think that is definitely something that people can relate to. So, Ken, how about you? What What's one of your favorite memories from college? I mean, you know, it, it, like Christian said, I mean, how can it not be when we finally crossed that stage, right? Uh, and, we, and we got that, that, that diploma. And I mean, I, I think about it now, and you think about all the things that, that, that we went through to, to get to that. You know, for folks who don't know, um, UF's program, one of the reasons I think is it's, it's, it's so great and, and such a high caliber is because they're, they're very selective of who they, they let in. Uh, and, and I say that because from day one, from the moment that we get accepted into that track, we're getting our butts kicked. <laughs> you know, those assignments are no jokes. It's so easy to fail a class because, you know, they, they're looking for you to misstep. But these are all the things that, you know, serve us so well now in our in our professional careers. Um, but as a kid who is being experienced, who's experiencing this for the first time, it's kind of a, lot, a big pill to swallow. Uh, like Christian said, you know, we're, we're, you know, I know in my family, you know, one of the first to, to, to go to college, like I said, um, and, you know, it's not like we're legacy students that have reference points of how things are supposed to be. We, we don't really know. We know that we had a dream. We know that we wanted to work in this and we wanted to learn about it. And then here we go. And it was just like years of boot camp is what it felt like the way that they trained us, you know. So 
yes, I, there were so many fantastic moments, many on the social side too. Everybody knows that UF is a great school for, for a social life also. But how can, how can it not be like the, 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 the top moment? How can it not be that moment that we finally graduated? And, and you know, Christian was there. We were all there in our robes and, and our parents were there. And it was, just a, it was just a magnificent moment. And I mean, I'll embarrass Christian a little bit, but you know, I, I remember when I first met him, he, he would hardly talk. You know, I mean, you'd, you'd have to you'd have to get it out of him. And now I have a friend in my life who's like a brother to me. You know, I mean, we talk all the time. You know, we've been at each other's weddings. I mean, you know, we, we share so much. But but these are the experiences, you know, that that we all went through together. And it was it was really hard. Those professors were no joke. Those assignments were no joke. You guys know that. Um, and, and here we are. But yeah, the, 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 the primo moment has got to be. When, when we finally crossed that stage and we said, you know, we, we somehow we did it. <laughs> Here's the proof, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to your point, such a source of pride for our families as well. You know, for those of us who were the first to graduate, I mean, again, I think these are stories and, uh, you know, just things that a lot of people coming from these immigrant and Hispanic backgrounds can relate to. So, you know, you talked about how great the program was when we were there, how it's so much better. And one of the best things about the program is that you have all these opportunities on campus to get experience. You know, you guys have referenced the radio stations. We have the TV stations uh, through the uh, Athletic Association for those of us who wanted to focus on sports. Um, but when we were there, you both noticed that as great as everything was, there was something missing. And so you both created the Noticias program. So can you talk about, you know, what that was and why it was so special and just how it came about? Yeah, I mean, so this happened, this was in our, in our senior year. Christian and I were down to our last semester. I think we needed some, some credits to, to, to fulfill. Uh, and, and, and I approached Christian and I think we were, having, we were having these conversations in the newsroom. This is when we were working at AM 850, by the way. So Noticias started off as a, as a radio product. And it was almost like a joke, like, hey, do you think if we pitched Tom Krinsky, the news director and our professor at the time, if we pitched him on the idea to let us sort of do some, um, you know, news in Spanish and create a product uh, that spoke to the Spanish speaking audience in North Central Florida, do you think we could get some some uh, independent credit uh, for it? You know, so we, we could get three credits for it and not have to go to a class. Right. Uh, but we would just work on this all the time. And he went for it, right, Christian? And, and, and so what we started doing was it was, very, it was very basic, right? Taking the newscasts in English that Christian and I would both produce and anchor. And then we started just translating them. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's really how it started. And what we started doing was we, we wanted to speak. We knew that there was a, a Hispanic audience, a Spanish-speaking audience in North Central Florida that just wasn't being spoken to, wasn't being catered to. They were just out there. And I knew this because these names and these types of stories would pop up all the time on the English side. So I'm th saying, you know, there's an entire community out there. Why don't we do something uh, that has two benefits? It, 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 it's, it speaks to this community. It, it, it offers them the, informa the same information that is important to them in their language. But it also offers us, the students and the university, an avenue uh, to create a larger learning space in all of this, Right. And this is before any of this stuff, I think, was really popular, this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, you know, DEI and all of that really within the last year or so is really when it's taken off. So, I mean, go to 2006, this wasn't really something that was being talked about, but it was a very forward-thinking uh, sort of effort, I think, Christian. I don't know how you feel about it, and I'm just glad that they went for it and they let us do it. And now this thing has grown immensely, you know? Unreal, unreal. Yeah, no, let's, let's be very clear that even though – you know, we had the Hispanic Student Association and all these groups. I was part of WEPA, which is the Puerto Rican Student Association there. Um, the school was oblivious to the fact that there was an audience yes. that, that wanted and could benefit from news in Spanish. Um, and thank goodness that Tom Krinsky was crazy enough to <laughs> allow us to move forward with it and just gave us the okay. And I, you know, when we went on the air, they got phone calls from people complaining that we were airing news in Spanish. And, uh, you know, I imagine that some of our classmates 
they may have not said anything, but they probably thought the same thing. You know, maybe they felt threatened or whatever. But um, but yeah, no, we we and I and I had done a story. I remember for WFT about you know the Hispanic community there. Clearly, there was a need. Clearly, there was a void. And I just feel so fortunate that we were able to, you know, materialize this idea that we thought wasn't going to even go anywhere. Um, and look at how far it's come. I, I feel humbled and honored. And I'm just so happy and proud uh, about our broadcast program and that it's allowed, allowed Noticias to grow. You know, I was speaking, we were at NAHJ recently, uh, Christian and I in Las Vegas, and, and, and UF was there. UF is a big supporter of, of, of the conference. They always have a booth. So I was there talking to some of the, you know, Joanna Hernandez, uh, who's a faculty as well. Uh, Harrison Hove, who, you know, we used, to, we used to go to school with. He's faculty and there now as well. And the stuff that they tell me about how much Noticias has grown, uh, it's just amazing because I don't know that we necessarily saw it beyond uh, you know, maybe that semester. We, we wanted to give folks a, a taste of what was missing and what it could be, right? And I'm just so glad that, uh, that, that, that it has grown. Um, Joanna was telling me they're looking for, for a faculty advisor for the entire program. I mean, we didn't have any of that. We had Christian and I on our off time <laughs> translating on our own and, time. Yeah, and trying to find stories that, that could speak to this audience. Uh, and now there are students, and I believe that they're even using it as a recruitment tool now for students uh, and, for, and for bilingual faculty to come in uh, and immerse themselves in a program uh, that, that, that I think is just doing, doing great things and, and serving an audience, like we mentioned, that just previously wasn't, it, they were ignored. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, because that leads me to my next question. Why is it important, you know, for UF and, you know, news in general? to tell the stories of these communities, like these immigrants and Hispanic and Latino, Latinas, like why is it important to tell these stories? I mean, oh. I, I, you know, that's, that's kind of a convoluted question because I, on one hand, I, you know, I almost can't believe we're, we're still talking about this, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we want to, in order to know our communities and in order for us to be our best and do our best job, uh, we need to make sure that people's voices are heard, that people's faces are seen. Um, and so that's why not only do we need to tell the stories of all communities, but we also need those faces and those voices in our newsrooms. Right. I can't even be, you know, I can't tell you how many times <clears throat> I've been the only person in the editorial meeting pitching an immigration story and having to, you know, fight um, and argue as to why we need to have this story in our newscast and trying to convince people. Like, I think of my time in San Diego. San Diego is a border community. Okay. Why am I having to convince people to do a story on immigration? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, again, that was another, in, in my case, a community that was being underserved, undercovered. Um, and that's why I made immigration my beat while I was in, in San Diego. Um, why do we do it? Because it makes us better. It, it informs us about our neighbors and their needs and what we need as communities to be better, to be more connected. I'll go a step further. All, all of those reasons obviously are, are, are important. And, and I think for any news organization of any kind, not just broadcast, uh, that wants to be taken seriously in 2022 as a player in, in this country and acknowledging all the different diverse cultures and the enclaves and the communities that exist, has to embrace. And not only Hispanic, <coughs> you're asking about Hispanic and you're asking about Latinos, but it goes well beyond that. I mean, there are so many different sort of, um, you know, communities that, that, that are just not being represented. Right now, we're talking about Latinos because I think what has happened here recently is Latinos have been sort of the sleeping giant for a while that has finally woken up. And so uh, just a couple of numbers here for you. 61 million people in the United States identify with being either Hispanic uh, or, or, or Latino, la, Latina, Latinx, Latine. Uh, there's so many different names now, right? Uh, but when you think about that number, 61 million, we're not talking about our parents anymore. You know, the, the little outliers that came here as immigrants. 
Uh, we're talking about people like the three of us here and so many others who have, you know, lived the American experience, have gone to college here, now participate uh, in, 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 in communities now, you know, that, that you know, have influence overall. Um, and, and so to talk to these folks and to give them examples of news that is happening in their community is very, very important. Um, but in addition to that, uh, like, like Christian was saying, you know, we're a growing community like so many others. Uh, and lack of representation is, 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 is a lack of being, I guess, productive at offering the communities that we live in their proper news. Uh, and, you know, if you look at any major city, you know, the numbers of Latinos are going up, even non-major cities, you know. And, and, and if you look at all the different diasporas that are forming, the different enclaves that are forming, it used to be that, you know, we would study Miami as an enclave for the Cuban uh, exodus that happened, you know. But now look at Orlando with Puerto Ricans, uh, Mexicans, obviously, throughout the different, you know, southern states and, and even in Chicago, for example. I mean, these are massive communities, you know. Um, and, and to not be able to be reflective and tell their stories is doing the larger uh, population a, a massive disservice. Thank you both for that, you know, really thoughtful, um, insightful answer to that. Let me switch gears here a little bit. Um, we know that broadcasting and journalism can be an incredibly rewarding career, but it doesn't come free of challenges. So can you each talk about what are some of the challenges that you face in your careers? Well, there are many. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think as of recent, um, I am putting more of an effort and this may not be the answer that you expect, but um, in sticking to the fundamentals of good storytelling and good writing, I think that um, media broadcast has been growing and expanding in such a way that it is great. You know, it makes information more accessible to, you know, a broader audience. It's not just the newscast that you sit down to watch on TV, but also social media. <clears throat> but it is, you know, especially with this, you know, issue of um, talking heads on TV that are not news, right? Um, it is so important to stick to good storytelling, good writing, and good balanced journalism, right? I think some of the stories that we cover, especially here in Miami, are so shocking and bombastic and you know, the, the, the pool of audiences towards good video is so great. But if you don't stick to good storytelling, good writing, and good balanced journalism, it's not news. And those are the fundamentals that nowadays, I, I, every day that I go into work, I'm very mindful to stick to because that's what's going to make me stand out as a journalist and more more importantly as a good journalist so that i think is one of the biggest struggles especially when you're competing with youtubers and people on social media that go on and or TikTok and go on and talk about news but they're not news yet they have these huge audiences and i think it's really important to differentiate ourselves and stand out with those good journalistic fundamentals you know, uh, Christian talks about those fundamentals, and the reason why I think it's so important to hone in on that is because if you master that, and if we continue to show people that that's what we do as professional journalists, <clears throat> then we can combat the broader issue that I think uh, Christian also hit on right now, one of the major challenges that we're having, and that is that information sharing is everywhere. That doesn't mean that the information is correct or that the information is good or that it's even pertinent. It just means that people are consuming details and information from many different avenues. Um, but those avenues don't always offer that information with the kind of diligence that Christian was talking about, the fair storytelling, um, the, you know, balanced stories, great stories. Um, that's what we do. But sometimes I think people just kind of get convoluted and they think everything is just the same. Um, social media obviously has something to do with that, but as, as well as, you know, streaming. Uh, and, and like I said, just there's information everywhere right now. So I think that's a massive challenge right now to differentiate ourselves from the cheese the gossip mm -hmm. you know, that isn't correct. That is, that is wrong. Uh, and that's, that's, that's 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword, I think, because not only is that the challenge, but at the same time, you know, what I think it does for us that are in the business, it reminds us that we have to continue to be great at, or, 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 or strive to be great with our daily assignments so that we can combat that. Uh, and it kind of holds us to a, to a certain standard as well. Um, and the other challenge, obviously, in the past couple of years has just been, you know, just the, the, the political divide in this country uh, and, and the perception that certain people have been have been sort of um, influenced by when it comes to the idea of, quote unquote, the media. That's the term that, you know, many people like to use the catch all term for us. Uh, obviously, you know, those of us that work in it, we know that there are differences between different things. Um, but, you know, we, that's that's also been a big challenge. You know, we are not trusted in general terms as much as we once were. Uh, and that is also part of the evolution of just, you know, the, this country, uh, the political rhetoric in this country, uh, and, and, and just basically life here in the U.S., you know, where people are. Uh, we know that, you know, families and, and individuals are facing a lot of their own challenges at home on the day and day, day in, day out, whether it be, you know, finances or, you know, finding a job or whatever the case may be. Uh, and a lot of times, their anger or their frustrations whenever they're challenged with those types of things seem to be targeted at the media because the media said this, the media said that. So we just seem to be an easy option for people to uh, kind of peg us uh, for, for, you know, being the bad guys. So that's another big. Yeah. And thank you for that. You know, it is definitely uh, something to keep in mind when we're consuming information, you know, just make sure that, you know, you're vetting your sources and where you're getting it from. Uh, so I appreciate you and, you know, all the journalists out there who continue to do this. I know it's incredibly difficult um, these days. So, you know, thank you to you and all the others out there doing it. Um, so let's, uh, let's go on to a happier note. It is a rewarding career. What are the, or what has been the most rewarding part of each of your careers? Hmm. Huh. Um, you want me to start? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, you know, I, besides the being able to help people, um, have a larger voice, you know, that is always extremely rewarding. Um, when you help someone, you know, get maybe the justice they deserve by speaking out, um, that's great. But I guess, as of recent, more uh, on a selfish note, <clears throat> being able to work doing something that you actually like to do um, on a daily basis might be the most rewarding thing. Um, being able to go out, connect with someone that's in need and help them get their story out. You know, you come back home and I think that's something that a lot of careers, a lot of jobs don't have that on a daily basis, you can feel that sense of reward of having helped someone by doing something that, yes, we work our butts off, right? It can be one of the most stressful jobs out there. Meeting what I call stupid deadlines <laughs> is can be insane, um, uh, can raise your butt, your, blood pressure like crazy but that sense of reward at the end of the day um is really something that selfishly to me is one of the best things about this job you know and it's, it, it, i don't i don't see it at, that 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 selfish but to to that point christian you know I, I think you know like christian said one of the best things about this job and the most rewarding thing is at least for me is getting to meet so many different people and tell their different stories right because everyone has got a story uh, and for me, the reward is when I know that the person who allowed me to tell their story um, feels complete that they trusted me with it and that I got to tell it. And that reward, uh, like Christian was saying, happens, you know, almost daily. You know, if, if you're out there and you're abiding by the principles of what it is that we're doing here and the, why we're doing it in the first place, you're going to get that reward. Uh, and, and I think for me, that's what it is. And, and, and again, going a step further, because we've been in this industry for this long already, you know, we've run out of fingers to count. Um, we've moved to different places, lived in different cities and have experienced that reward with different sets of people in different settings in different parts of the country. And that really makes this whole experience worthwhile. And I mean, the day that that goes away, then that's maybe the day that we need to start considering doing a different, uh, different job. But as long as we step into this every single day, knowing that, 
Um, I think I think that's that's really the reward in all. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you today, later on today, I'm actually going to go do a sit down one on one interview with uh, the police chief here in, in Dallas. His name is Eddie Garcia. He's relatively new and he's the first Latino police chief that this city has had in 160 years. Unreal. He's, he's, a, he's yeah. a Puerto Rican. He's originally from Puerto Rico. Uh, who had, you know, a, a very lengthy uh, uh, law enforcement career in California and now got hired as the as the top cop here in Dallas. So I'm looking forward to that because, you know, he's trusting me to be able to tell that story. And I think there's a reward to be had there, you know, um, but it's 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 that sort of not knowing and just knowing that there's a gift there somewhere uh, every single day in, 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 in being, you know, Listen, I don't take any of this stuff for granted. I mean, it, it's a privilege to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear people talk about this all the time, and there's plenty of reasons to get upset on a daily basis, too, and get frustrated with equipment not working, with the stressful deadlines, with decisions that are made on your behalf that you don't necessarily agree with. There's a bunch of reasons to run, right? But here's the one thing I've always heard, even from people who've been in this industry longer than us, and I'll, and I'll leave it at this. Uh, they say, this sure beats working for a living. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite I heard, quotes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it's all of this stuff, but it sure beats working for a living. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, I think with of that. that said, uh, I'll ask you each for uh, quickly to give us one piece, well, one piece of advice that you have for any aspiring journalist. I always tell people, you know, um, have a bit of a, of, a, of a short plan and a long plan. Um, first of all, I would say be in this for the right reasons. So let's just start there. Okay. If, if you want to pursue a career in this, just know that there's not a whole lot of money to be made in the, for, you know, you know, especially in the first few years, this is not why we got into this. We didn't get into this because we thought, you know, there were pots of gold or whatever. Uh, and, and Christian can tell you also, you know, how difficult Monica, you know, how hard it is, um, you know, to get those first uh, few jobs and, 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 and get paid peanuts. So don't do it for that reason. Okay. Uh, it, it could be lucrative later on if you do it for the right reasons, but you, you have to do this because you, you, you care about news, you care about information and the communities that you serve. Uh, and, and, and you're going to serve them by telling these stories and, and being right by them. So don't ever forget that. That's the creed. That never changes. The technology changes. The people change. The city might change, but the creed doesn't. All right. So that's number one. And then number two, I would honestly say to people, um, and and I've, I've been able to see this now, um, and I, I don't know that I had enough experience early on to say this to people, but I do say it now. Have a short game plan and a long game plan uh, and, and, and certain goals that you need to hit between that, those windows. Um, and, and if it doesn't happen for you, um, it doesn't mean that you're a bad journalist. It just uh, you maybe, maybe consider, you know, at that point, if you want to pivot, um, but because I see a lot of people who are also in this industry. Um, you know, they, they, they stick around for a while and they, they end up being very frustrated with things um, because for whatever reason, just things didn't happen for them in their careers the way that they would want to. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, um, it's just that um, I would say uh, time goes by very fast. <laughs> so have, have a short plan, a short game plan and a long, long game plan. That's uh, that's funny, Ken, because that reminds me of Sid Pactor's intro to telecommunications, like first day of class or he's like, you know, congrats, you want to do this, say goodbye to money, say goodbye to weekends and holidays and your nights. And <clears> it's it's very true for those of us, you know, when we're first starting so, out. I know what that's like, because we've all done that at some point in time. Some of us keep doing that, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What What about you, Christian? What's your advice? Um, you know, I think don't compare yourself to others. Don't measure yourself to others. I think everybody has their own path. I think the key to your success is what makes you different, what makes you you. Don't try to be like someone else either. Um, and be willing to work really hard. I mean, if, if, if you're in it for the right reasons, work hard, um, be yourself, recognize your strengths, and go down that path. That's, you know, I love that. It goes back to our previous discussion on imposter syndrome and, you know, comparing ourselves to our classmates and, you know, their backgrounds and where they're coming from compared to where we're coming from. So I love that. Uh, thank you both so much for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I do want to remind you that in just over two weeks, we will be having our Hispanic Alumni Weekend. We're hosting it in person in Gainesville this year. Uh, please check out the UF Guy Instagram page for more information. 
or you can check out the Association of Hispanic Alumni uh, website. You'll get more details on there as well. We hope to see you in Gainesville on September 30th and October 1st. Ken, Christian, thank you both so much. It was so nice catching up with you. And go Gators. Go Gators. <laughs> <laughs> see you guys. Bye-bye.